Hello and welcome to Nudge, the consumer psychology podcast. Now the guest I've got on the show today probably doesn't need much of an introduction. He is one of the biggest names in behavior science, a pioneer of marketing and a brilliant speaker and writer. Rory Sutherland is Vice Chairman of Ogilvy UK and an absolute expert on consumer behaviour. He analyses what branding means, what creativity is, and the value of persuasion over compulsion. On a personal level, I've found his book Alchemy to be one of the best behaviour science books of the last five years or so. The conference he hosts at Ogilvy called Nudge Stock is probably also the best conference in the industry. And well, as you can hear, I'm very excited about having him on the show. In today's show, Rory talks about how counterintuitive thinking is the secret to marketing success how approaching problems from a behavioral perspective often works best, and his insight into how trains should be improved, why people don't wear masks, and the real reason why we all use Zoom. To kick off, I asked why counterintuitive thinking is so important. This is a really important um, question, a great way to start. And it took me about eight years of working with behavioral science, both in academia and business, uh, to understand a vital distinction between business and academia. And it's this. So I'm incredibly and pathetically grateful to all the academics who have done uh, very important, robust, uh, scientifically you know, validated work in behavioral science to show that the precepts of mainstream economics can't be relied on uh, predictively to understand, map, or explain human behavior, okay? But there is a difference, which is it suddenly occurred to me a few years ago that in science, to, to pursue your career successfully as a scientist, you have to be right. You have to be demonstrably right. In business, you just need to know where your competitors are wrong. And one of the reasons, oddly, is that in, se in a sense, science is um, a pursuit which tries to increase the amount of certainty in the world, which runs counter to my own temperament and self-interest, which is the reason I value behavioral science is because actually it argues that we should acknowledge that there is much more uncertainty in the world than we like to think. You know, we should be much less confident about economic models. We should be much less confident about market research. Okay. We should be much less confident about using past behavioral data to model the future. Okay. Those are the three things that business and government and policy making tend to use in seeking to understand human behavior. Okay. It's asking people, market research. It's looking at what people do already and projecting forwards. You know, that's essentially, you know, modeling or you know, most of transport investment works that way. And then the third one is basically using um, the precepts of neoliberal economics to assume that people are naive utility maximizers um, uh, who will always buy, uh, you know, the best product at the lowest possible price, okay? And once you realize the value to me, uh, and I'm not only a practitioner of behavioral science, what we as in the behavioral science practice at Ogilvy do is we absolutely demand that behavioral science works best when married to a high degree of creativity. This isn't a kind of process-driven um, sequential, logical approach to problems. It requires leaps of the imagination, okay, in order for it to deliver its full value. And the reason for that, very simply, is that when you get people to acknowledge that there may be more uncertainty than it, they like to think or that they've conventionally thought, it doesn't guarantee that you'll be successful in and of itself what it does do is it massively increases the possible creative solution space right once you admit psychological solutions to the armory of uh, of possible problem solving tools the scope for creative imagination and imaginative testing goes up enormously 
And the greatest value, I think, of behavioral science ultimately is not that it provides you with answers. It's that it encourages you to test much more widely than conventional logic would suggest. In science, you have to be right. But in business, you simply have to be less wrong than your competitor. It's a really interesting point, and it's led us in business and in governmental policy to heavily rely on market research, forecasts, and classic economic theory. But this reliance on conventional thinking can also be to our downfall. Take this example from Rory's book, Alchemy. He shares a story about a client that offered customers the chance to win free energy for a year, worth over £1,000. Now, this promotion only received 67,000 entries, a really modest amount considering the company's size. So the next year, they took a leaf out of Rory's book and went against conventional thinking. Instead of offering something with intrinsic value like money off your bill, they offered instead a cute penguin nightlight worth about £15. Now, this shouldn't work. This should not get more entries. But... We're irrational and we love cute animals. So that promotion received over 360,000 entries, over six times more than the money off offer. One customer actually turned down the offer of a £200 refund on their bill saying, no, I'd rather have the penguin. In business and especially in marketing, counterintuitive thinking often wins. And just to give a funny little and very timely example of this, I take a little bit of pride in this fact that I was a massive video conferencing advocate um, in, 19, in 2019, in 2018. Okay. And the general assumption I noticed in 2018 was, well, if this was any good, people would already have done it. And my understanding of network theory and behavioral science, in particular the understanding in behavioral science that actually habit norms and social proof are the really big driving forces of behavior not utility you know maximization necessarily it's just you know there's an enormous kind of gravitational pull among human beings to do what everybody else does right okay and so it did occur to me in 2018 when Ogilvy, some visionary at Ogilvy took out a Zoom account for the whole business. Okay, and I discovered that Zoom, technologically and psychologically, was an order of magnitude more usable than all the alternatives, a whole variety of reasons. Okay, I thought, well, maybe people aren't using this because actually it doesn't work. But maybe people aren't using it just because nobody's using it because nobody else is using it and if you only if only 10 percent of people use zoom 10 percent of the time it will only deliver about five percent of its potential benefits you know if you still have to commute into work and then you end up making one zoom call in a shabby little office in in, in, in you know at work you haven't really benefited from zoom that much okay you've saved a taxi fare on the other hand if 10 people all use so i instigated as an experiment in my team zoom fridays i said okay let's all work from home on fridays and work remotely and we'll meet up on zoom at the beginning of the day and we'll meet up at the end of the day and we'll all catch up but then the time in between is for you to do all the bits of work that aren't location dependent and it worked really really well and So that's just an example of the fact that when you acknowledge the fact that the barrier to something, to some new reality, might be as much psychological as it is technological or economic, your possible solution space increases in surface area enormously. As Rory says, social norms can encourage behaviours. Simply buying a Zoom account for staff won't encourage usage, but designating a day for everyone to use it can. This is another of those counterintuitive nudges. It reminded me of a 2019 study from Poland. The study was set up to measure the effectiveness of messaging around recycling. Ultimately, the researchers wanted to see what type of message drove people towards action. Messages that spoke about the environmental benefits, they failed. Messages that spoke about economic benefits, they also failed. But the message that said your neighbour recycles more than you was hugely successful, significantly changing behaviour. Product benefits are far less effective at motivating us than simple social proof. Zoom's next marketing campaign shouldn't be about its latest feature or functionality. Instead, it should highlight how everyone from your kids at school to your grandma at her art class, uses Zoom. 
So counterintuitive thinking helps encourage behavior, but it can also help you come up with some groundbreaking business ideas. There's a great guy, I can't remember his name, but he's some sort of tech um, guru, sort of startup king, you know, those people. Okay, and he his model for how you start a business works like this, right? You take a business sector, you make a list of all the assumptions that pervade that sector, you know, that X is important, that Y is important, that consumers really care about Z, okay? And you will find these generalized assumptions pervading through the whole sector. Then you find out which of those many assumptions either isn't true to begin with or won't be true in two years' time. And now, when you've discovered what everybody else is wrong about, you've got a business opportunity, you know. And that, that's why I think most of the kind of billion-dollar businesses we see, the startups, are actually logically nonsensical, right? There was nothing in marketing information to tell you, if you were Dyson, that there was even a tiny market for a 700-euro vacuum cleaner, right? You could have looked at the market. You could have looked at where, where the top end, the sweet spot, the low end of the market lay. You could go and do market research and say, would you pay 800 quid for a vacuum cleaner? In which case, you would have got the response, piss off, right? Okay. You know, I, I, even if James Dyson had come to me, I would have told him he was insane because a vacuum cleaner is a grudge purchase. You only buy one when your old vacuum cleaner breaks. And anyone who could spend 800 euros on a vacuum cleaner probably employs a cleaning person anyway. So they don't even hoover their own house. Okay. And yet it's when you discover something that everybody else assumed that ain't so, that's when you've got the potential for real innovation. Red Bull, you know, the assumption that a soft drink has to taste particularly pleasant, <laughs> you know, all of these things. So I occasionally go to academics and say, have you got any findings that kind of don't replicate, you know, or, or have you got a theory that you've always believed that you can't prove, you know, have you got any sort of really, sh you know, shit experiments that, you know, now the reason for that is that um, uh, I don't I don't need to be right in order to have a business or business advantage. I don't need to be right universally all the time. That's physics, right? That's not business. OK, I just need to find something that my competitors are frequently and significantly wrong about. I just finished reading uh, Seth Godin's book, Purple Cow. That's a really interesting read with lots of thought provoking examples, but it does lack a bit of actionable information. Anyway, there is a great example of counterintuitive thinking in that book. The French subsidiary of McDonald's subsidised and published a really interesting report. Conducted with health professionals in the field, the report suggested that the French should not visit fast food outlets like McDonald's more than once a week. Now, at first glance, this seems like a bad thing for McDonald's to publish. After all, you need to encourage people to come to your store, not deter them away. Now, this view was shared by McDonald's bosses in America. They immediately pulled the plug and buried this report. But I think they were missing out on something. See, the official report comes with an element of authority, co-produced by health professionals, meaning you're more likely to trust it than typical marketing. And it also sets a really interesting anchor. Visiting McDonald's once a week is now okay. Sure, going more than once isn't great, but visiting once a week is actually fine according to health professionals. Now, very few French people visit McDonald's more than once a month, so this message might actually encourage more visits. With this new anchor, potential visitors may get to the end of the week, realise they haven't had their Big Mac, and head out to treat themselves. It's a shame the report was canned, because put side by side against a normal McDonald's ad, and I reckon the report would be far more effective at driving sales. Of course, most of us don't actually want to eat more McDonald's. Instead, we want to lose weight and save the environment. So I asked Rory how we could encourage more people to cut their carbon emissions and to take the train. Um, very simple, okay. First of all, what we need to understand is that rail network met metrics and engineering metrics, and that means, by the way, um, the metrics by which rail companies are rewarded or punished, okay, do not tally or correlate at all well with the, with the deep emotional metrics that people care about, okay? 
So you can make a huge business case, and indeed government will reward or punish you for the extent to which you maintain punctuality. Whereas the rather brilliant psychological invention of having the driver come on the tannoy and explain we'll be stopped at these signals for a few minutes has a bigger difference to your general level of satisfaction and low levels of anxiety. Information can solve psychological problems. It can't really solve logistical problems in that sense, consumer information. So uh, possibly the best bit of advice I gave in my entire working life was just to say to British Airways, look, you will probably have data that shows that people are happier when their plane is punctual. Now, you've come from that to infer that punctuality is a major driver of happiness. Now, I, they are correlated, but actually punctuality there may be a confounding variable. That what makes people unhappy when their plane's late is the level of uncertainty, not the level of chronological delay. And I said there is an enormous difference in to customer experience between arriving at Gatwick and saying BA2467 delayed, okay, at which point I'm now having conniptions. Will I make my meeting? Will I miss things? What do I do? Do I now have to sit here staring at the board every three minutes for further information? Versus BA2467 delayed 48 minutes, in which case I go, Oh, look, there's a Lebanese restaurant terminal, you know, the North Terminal. Let's go and get a breakfast, right? At Geneva Airport, I had a flight that was delayed by 50 minutes. I got my hair cut because there's a barber there, right? I'm totally, I always allow an hour or two's buffer in my flight, okay? I am totally unconcerned in a modern airport with Wi-Fi and with, you know, particularly if there's a lounge or a restaurant or a bar, okay? I'm pretty much unconcerned by delays less than, you know, an hour and a half. In his book, Rory states that solving problems using only rationality is like playing golf using only one club. Rationality has its uses, but you will improve your thinking a great deal if you abandon the artificial certainty and learn to think ambiguously about human psychology. In other words, if you only make decisions based on certain quantifiable things that you can measure, then you'll miss out on a shed load of groundbreaking improvements that can't be measured. This is a huge problem. It means we marketers miss out on a great deal of ideas. But even worse, it means that these great irrational ideas are rarely ever funded. Here's Rory explaining why. Talking to someone at London Transport, they cannot get funding for information systems very easily. The biggest thing that improved passenger experience on tr Transport for London was dot matrix displays on the platform because we're happier waiting 11 minutes for a train when we know it's coming in 11 minutes than waiting five minutes for a train in a state of anxiety and uncertainty. And yet, because they measure only improvements in objective journey time, not improvements in subjective experience, they can far more easily get justification to spend two million quid on a set of points than they can get justification to provide a cutting edge informational system that delivers far more in terms of happiness and incidentally probably delivers far more in terms of repeat use okay but that's harder to measure isn't it it's re it's really really easy to measure the extent to which a set of points um, improves punctuality statistics right you know, you can measure that and just about really easily. I am fairly confident. I would confidently predict that in a world in which I was omniscient, I could say, don't worry, actually spend money on information systems because it increases your passenger va uh, levels. It also, by the way, might actually, it I, I actually might um, also help, information might also help you um, uh, create more intelligent behavior among consumers, by the way, you know, because there, there are a lot of biases caused by the London tube map far too many people use the central line because it's red and goes in a straight line from left to right. And far too few people use the Victoria line because it's blue, not very visible and wiggly. Okay. I could improve the tube overnight by making the Victoria line red and the, um, <laughs> the central line, uh, you know, duck egg blue. Right. Okay. But, because psychological solutions pre nudge theory weren't really allowed into the, um, problem solvers toolkit okay the money was spent on the set of points where there was a very easily measurable outcome i'm sure you get an improvement in passenger experience and an improvement in travel volumes if you solve the problem psychologically and the psychological problem 
may come at a tiny minuscule fraction of the cost of an engineering solution to the same problem. Right Now, <coughs> engineers aren't totally thick. When they design televisions, your television only produces three colours because the human eye only perceives the relative strength in red, green and blue. There's no point in having a yellow pixel in your television because yellow and equal amounts of red and green are indistinguishable to the human brain. OK, so televisions are designed around human epistemology and perception, but transport networks aren't. And we need to do the same thing. Now, it sounds like Rory is taking a big swipe at the transport industry here, but I should add that he's not totally lost hope with airlines. In his book, he talks about how the new Boeing 787 Dreamliner is a triumph of psychophysics. The engineers tweaked the lighting, pressurization and humidity to mitigate the effects of jet lag. Moreover, visual illusions, in particular a spacious entranceway, created the impression of spaciousness. In reality, it is actually 16 inches narrower than a Boeing 777, but to many passengers, it feels significantly wider. It makes you wonder why engineers don't spend more time focusing on this. After all, what would you rather? A magic plane that feels massive where you don't get jet lag, or a standard plane that gets you to your destination, let's say, 15 minutes faster? This is a benefit of focusing on psychologic, as Rory calls it. But before we ended our first discussion, I asked Rory to actually apply his own counterintuitive thinking to solve a current problem. I asked how he would encourage people to wear a face mask, and in classic Sutherland style, he came up with this inspired response. One of the points about behavioural science would be, if you wanted to persuade people to wear masks in a rational universe, in a naively rational universe, okay, you tell people all about things um, uh, that um, uh, that masks reduce the risk of infection by X, they reduce, you'd give them a bunch of statistics, okay? And by the way, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't do that. Nevertheless, a problem exists and persists because wearing a mask feels weird. Okay. Now, let me. Uh, um, the person who first spotted this that um, social embarrassment of any kind is something we don't control consciously. We can hack it, but we don't control it. If I asked you to go into your office wearing Crocs, okay, you would suffer fairly major pain, wouldn't you? And anxiety, you know, and, and discomfort, okay? The, the, the great thing about Crocs is actually they're the world's most effective contraceptive, aren't they? Um, because, <laughs> because no one can contemplate having sex with someone wearing Crocs. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and I've got a friend who's a massive uh, Crocs fan. And he said, but I've got six kids. And I said, yeah, but all your kids were born before Crocs were invented. And he went, oh, fair point. Right. Um, now, anyway, I'm I'm gagging, but uh, I'm having a gag. But what um what uh, Abraham Lincoln once said is that if I were to ask a man to spend the whole day in his local town walking about wearing his wife's bonnet, okay, and um, I'm fairly sure Mrs. Washington was a fairly was it Martha his wife was a fairly major hat buyer. Anyway, but anyway, he said if if, if you were to ask a, a man to go around his town wearing his wife's bonnet, he would uh, feel a sense of social discomfort. You know, social discomfort is, again, like habit and convention, is a very, very powerful force. It's an emotional force. We don't control it, okay? Right? You you couldn't fundamentally feel comfortable wearing Crocs uh, into the office or wearing, you know, uh, something utterly ridiculous, right? You would feel unpleasant. And... Um, Washington spotted this. It's something we do with Diageo, which is people feel awkward or asking for cocktails, right? If you ask for a beer or a glass of wine, you don't feel any sense of social awkwardness or embarrassment. One of the major properties of Coca-Cola as a brand is you can ask for a Coke anywhere from a Tanzanian beach shack to a Michelin three-star restaurant and not feel ridiculous doing so. That's not true of Dr. Pepper, is it, right? You know, if I go to the Manoir Doc uh, Manoir Cat Saison, I can ask for a Diet Coke, right? If I ask for a Dr Pepper Zero, you know, uh, it would be a major sort of sense of, you know, I'd feel a major sense of awkwardness. And the fact is, emotions are real, right? So my partial solution to mask wearing is really intriguing, which is combine it with a hat, right? Because weirdly, wearing a mask with a hat doesn't feel weird. 
Now, I don't know why that is. I discovered it by accident. A masked man with a hat can be an international man of mystery. Uh, if it's a trilby, he can be a bank robber in an Ealing comedy, OK? Uh, if you wear a cap, you know, you can feel a bit like a mafioso, right? But something about it, I don't know why, effectively removes the feeling of weird. And so what I'm always pointing about these emotions is you can't use rational argument to overcome. You know, I can talk to you rationally about cocktails till the um, uh, cows come home, but it won't change your feeling of discomfort in asking for that kind of drink. OK, now, one of the things I needed to discover is that there are many, you know, if you go to a high end bar, the guy there is a mixologist. He's spent three years becoming a mixologist. There is I always thought, God, if I asked for a cocktail, I think, oh, God, this guy's a pain in the ass. You know, ugh, why can't he just ask for a glass of wine? What it took, what the, the, the absolute revelation there was that, no, no, if you ask these people, what do you recommend? Go and mix me something. They're ecstatically happy. Because it's pretty annoying training for two years as a mixologist and then being asked to remove corks, you know. Counterintuitive ideas that consider our psychology can offer a far wider range of solutions to problems, whether that's dealing with unhappy customers at airports or encouraging people to wear masks. In fact, Rory's mask solution, wearing a hat to feel like a man of mystery, reminded me of a famous product success story. Now, back in the 1980s, Curad wanted to challenge the Band-Aid brand for the market of adhesive bandages. Now, most people thought Curad was crazy. Band-Aid is a household institution with a brand name known so well that it's practically generic. So how could Curad break into this market? Well, they used a bit of counterintuitive thinking. Rather than targeting the buyers, they targeted the buyer's children. To do so, they changed the plain pinkish coloured plaster and instead added a superhero motif. Kids, unsurprisingly, wanted a Spider-Man plaster or a Star Wars plaster over a plain one. And when one kid saw another wearing this plaster, they'd beg their parents for the same type of plaster when they inevitably grazed their knee. It didn't take very long for Curad to do the unthinkable and take a significant chunk of market share from Band-Aid. And with children in several countries now being asked to wear masks, maybe we should stop with the rational messages about how effective they are and instead consider creating a Wonder Woman mask for kids to wear. Okay, folks, that's all we have time for today. I will be back with another episode with Rory Sutherland in two weeks, and it's a real cracker, so don't miss it. If you sign up to my mailing list, I will send you an email as soon as that next episode goes live, so just click the link in the show notes to sign up, and I'll send you a nudge tip every other week as well, which is all of the nudges that I've found in the wild that I think are worth sharing. And if for some reason you haven't picked up a copy of Rory's book, Alchemy, then, well, what are you waiting for? Please do go and check it out. It's easily one of the best and most inspiring behaviour science books that I've read in the past couple of years. So I've left a link to the book in the show notes so you can go and check it out. I've had great fun working on this episode and if you've enjoyed listening to it then feel free to get in touch and let me know. I'm on Twitter at P underscore Agnew and you can contact me on LinkedIn as well. Just search for Phil Agnew on there. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of Nudge. Thank you.